Well, for a second, which is the unit of measurement for radiation, it's magnetized on. And, uh, yeah, he was a great guy. I had the privilege of going to a, a mobile policy workshop at that university where Hertz had built the, the world's first radio. It's kind of, kind of special. So our panel today, we have John Leibovitz uh, from the FCC, who's the Deputy Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and uh, was the leader of the spectrum portion of the National Broadband Plan, from which the famous 500 megahertz uh, goal uh, comes. Um, Carl Nebbia is the Deputy Associate Administrator of the NTIA's Office of Spectrum Management. And NTIA is one of these um, agencies that I've never heard of before I started working in Washington, despite having worked in, in the spectrum field for 15 years before that. But they manage the government spectrum, which is considerable. Neil Freed is the Chief Counsel in the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, and he's involved in the, the newly created Spectrum Working Group. Uh, as is uh, the man sitting next to him, Sean Chang, who's the Senior Democratic Counsel in the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, and the two of them are going to tell us about what the Spectrum Working Group is up to. Mita Bidwine is a Senior Policy Advisor to Senator Warner, and is very knowledgeable in Spectrum. Matthew Hussey is the Legislative Assistant, uh, currently to Senator Snow, and Matthew was an actual trained technical person, an engineer. Uh, so we're we're lucky to have. It. So what this is all about is the mobile revolution, right? Uh, mobility is it's a new it's bringing in a new era in computing. I mean. Uh, there are different ways to sort of characterize the, the major eras in computing, but we're starting with personal computers and internet computing, and various generations of the web. Mobile computing is the next big thing. And one of the benchmarks of that is that last year, for the first time in history, smartphones outsold PCs. And probably by in another three years or so, uh, tablets will outsell PCs as well. So it's a shift to what the, what the sort of basic paradigm of computing is. And this revolution is powered by many things, but spectrum, microelectronics, and software are key components of it, especially spectrum. Which, I, I've had a surprising number of conversations with reporters that begin with, what is it exactly we're talking about with spectrum? Do you mean like, the airwaves. And so I thought that it would be useful to sort of define the term. Uh, spectrum is a, is a name that's given to sort of the entire range of electromagnetic radiation. Um, it, the physics of it, it, it's charged particles, they move through the air in waves, and, and these waves are different frequencies ranging from very small subatomic scale to very large. Theoretically, you could have a, uh, a frequency as large as the entire universe, although no one's measured that. Um, and so the, they, they have, and the properties of electromagnetic spectrum, I mean, what we basically have are sine waves, right? Take the letter S and turn it on its side, and a sine wave has a certain frequency, which is from, it goes up, comes down, crosses the midpoint, and returns, and the, the length of time and space from beginning to end is the frequency of the wave. Um, and that's the case, you know, regardless of, of where, where we are in the spectrum. And the way that we use these electromagnetic waves to communicate information is by modifying or distorting the pure sine wave. And, and uh, I'm not going to get into the, into the details. You know, that's the basic idea. We modify sine waves to move information. And these modifications have to be intelligible to a receiver. And there are, there are combinations of modified sine waves that, that are not intelligible to typical receivers. 
and that's what we call interference. And it can come from natural sources, it can come from man-made sources, it can come from signals that are created by a transmitter, bounce off a wall, and then get picked up somewhere else or get modified. Now, when we talk about the interference, radio interference, I think the best way to think about that is like a rainbow. So a rainbow is something that doesn't exist independently of the frame of reference of an observer, right? I mean, rainbows are not physical things in the same way that, say, stones and mountains are. And a rainbow is actually an example of an electromagnetic um, radiation that has been distorted by uh, an, an outside factor. So when sunlight, which is a which is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, passes through droplets of water, it's diffracted, and, and the component colors are separated, so that an observer standing in a certain location sees the rainbow. So the rainbow is a distortion of pure visible light. So it depends on your point of view, and it also depends on the water. Um, and all sorts of electromagnetic interference is like that, where it depends on, on a combination of factors to create interference. So interference is also something that sort of doesn't exist as a standalone uh, entity. It's a property of a certain combination of transmitter, receiver, and distorter. Spectrum propagation is a function of the power, primarily, of the transmitter. Not, uh, it's not the case that, that particular frequencies are better at propagating than others. The propagation of electromagnetic energy is a matter of energy. Um, Peter Rosavi, uh, here in the front row, is a distinguished spectrum expert. Is that pretty much correct, what I just said? Uh, that is correct. Though different frequencies have different abilities to penetrate um, different substances. So very high frequencies would not be able to go through buildings or trees or whatever. So some frequencies are not doing much better for certain applications. Yeah. And this is a function of the wavelength, right? Yes. And so it turns out that, you know, say a six foot a window that's six feet wide, the, uh, the six foot sine wave. That's about 500 megahertz. And uh, a 4 inch sine wave is about 4 gigahertz. And it seemed like the, cho the choicest frequencies for mobile applications are, are in that general range where the waves are small enough to pass through a window, but they're large enough not to be blocked by the foliage on common trees. Sure. And this is not accidental. <laughs> um, uh, and, and finally, the modern cellular architecture, you know, in, in the first generation of, of cellular systems, you know, they put up a tower, the tower would broadcast omnidirectional, and then there'd be another tower over here, so if you're close to this tower, you'd be connected to it, the tower would, would essentially have an omnidirectional transmitter. As these, as the technologies evolve, you know, two things have happened. The towers have been sectorized. So instead of one signal going 360 degrees from the tower, it's the, the propagation patterns divided up into thirds so that you have uh, different frequencies in like three slices of a pie. And, it can, and sometimes it's sixth now. But then within, and so this is now called a macro cell. Within the macro cell now, we find that network operators are putting up smaller cells, micro cells, to serve really dense populated areas within the overall coverage of the, of the tower. So this is what we mean by a hierarchical architecture. So large cells for coverage, small cells for, for performance, and the, the smallest of the small cells are the femto cells and pico cells that are like in your house. So uh, NTIA and FCC control spectrum rights in the United States. 
Um, and these, this is uh, the NPIA famous uh, spectrum map. The thing that's significant about it, I think, is that it, when you consider that every edge, every boundary between one of these uh, allocations, there's a potential conflict of rights at the edge. So there are particular engineering measures that are taken to uh, minimize those conflicts. But you know, in say the in the widespread case, that was sort of a classic example of you had one application that was really low energy um, right next door to an application that was high energy, and there was an interference issue with it. But it has to do with the, the engineering of of one of the receivers. Um, so they, we can think about you know that map as this is a, a form of spectrum sharing. It's you know because we take this entire range and then we divide it up into licensees. So that's a form of sharing, right? Uh, there's another form of sharing that goes on on the commercial networks, which is essentially someone has a license to a particular slice of spectrum, and then they sell accounts to people, and those people, you know, you and me. Are, are using that spectrum, we're sharing it with each other. The applications we run are sharing it with each other. And that's a kind of sharing of the spectrum which is extremely efficient and can get up to 95% utilization. It relies on scheduling. You know, like the, a, basically there's a moderator that tells people when they can talk. Um, and so the coordination function that the, that the network operator performs is really critical to that kind of sharing taking place. Another kind of sharing that we're starting to hear more about is the sharing, the sharing of raw spectrum, which, uh, which is a unlicensed spectrum. And there are some wonderful benefits when it comes to the sharing of, of raw spectrum that we see in unlicensed systems like Wi-Fi. And there are limitations as well. Um, on a large scale, it's extremely difficult to coordinate sharing of raw spectrum. It's much more difficult than it is to actually share cooked spectrum as a, as a management function. In research, where hopefully in the long run will uh, help us develop technologies that can actually share raw spectrum more efficiently then you can do that. So as far as uh, there's your basic overview and what we're going to do is uh, beginning with Mr. Leibovitz, um, the panelists are going to give brief um, introductory remarks and then I'll ask them some questions <coughs> and if we have time left in our two hours uh, which we're probably not going to use the whole time. <coughs> Probably have to huh? Yeah, then uh, then you guys get to chime in. So without further ado, let me pass the baton to Mr. Leibovitz. Uh, do you, you want to stay? Do you want to do sit different? Oh, what would you prefer? Right. Whatever you're comfortable with. Thank you. 
So first, just a context. Um, I think everyone here has heard lots of statistics about the growth of mobile. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, um, except to say, you know, one of the more striking statistics that was spoken of last week is the year over year the, the growth in uh, cellular data was 123 percent. That's on the licensed spectrum side, and then on the unlicensed side, we've got tens of millions of Wi-Fi access points out there. So I think there's just no question. There's huge growth, huge, huge usage, and that kind of frames everything we're talking about. Um, from the SEC's perspective, uh, this is more than just bits and bytes. I mean, I think what we're talking about is a huge growth engine for the economy, and that's uh, what we're trying to facilitate. Um, we're trying to enable uh, growth by unlocking value in the spectrum. Um, but also these numbers represent a big challenge. I think the, the chairman last week put it that it's, a, it's a, the good kind of challenge. It's the kind of challenge you have when you have you know, a successful industry, in this case multiple industries, using the spectrum so well and so, and so intensively and so much consumer demand. But the problem is, uh, how, how will we accommodate the surging demand? Um, so uh, our goal at the SEC is to address this challenge for the benefit of the economy and also for the benefit of consumers. Um, obviously, those are uh, pretty closely linked. So how do we uh, address, address the capacity gap? Um, as the chairman said last week, our view is there's not a single bullet. Um, uh, and we, we really need an all of the above approach. Um, so our, in our view, we need more spectrum, more efficient use of spectrum. Uh, we need to rethink some of the ways in which we manage the spectrum. Um, and we're working on all these fronts to the FCC simultaneously. We've got a lot of people all over the agency working on it. So um, when Chairman Dukowski joined the commission, one of the biggest challenges that he faced and, and those of us working faced um, was how do we restart a, a spectrum pipeline that basically had dried up. Um, there have been a series of big auctions. Um, uh, previously, there was not much spectrum in the pipeline. Um, and yet, this came at a time when growth just really started to skyrocket, I think, in ways which people never really expected. Um, so this was, became one of the big focal points of our national broadband plan, which uh, Richard mentioned before. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the, the, the broadband plan helped to um, sort of channel and focus a public dialogue on spectrum that has been very productive. I mean, you know, there are lots of different aspects of the plan and any particular aspect I think people may agree or disagree with, but I think it's served to, to, to kind of organize uh, a healthy discussion in the public about um, our country's spectrum resources. Um, and, you know, in, in following that, I think there have been some really great um, uh, actions by other parts of government, in particular Congress passing the, uh, the spectrum bill um, the administration has been uh, doing some really important things. Um, and so, you know, a lot has changed the last few years, and, and what we've tried to do at the SEC is, you know, adapt our plan um, to account for thing, new developments. Um, uh, we're still very much, you know, um, hoping to, um, uh, you know, realize many of the goals in broadband plan, but, you know, as time passes, uh, we have more information, and there's new tools at our disposal, but now, now we have to start, um, you know, looking at different ways to, to uh, realize them. So uh, last week, the chairman uh, announced um, our mobile action plan. And I just want to quickly go through it at a high level, at least the, the spectrum parts of it, uh, since it also includes some non-spectrum pieces. Um, the, the plan basically has three tracks. Um, the first track uh, uh, we call core opportunities. Um, and these are things that the SEC can do that are sort of well known in the SEC's basic quiver of um, arrows. Um, you know, use of football, you know, the acting football analogy, the blocking and tackling. Um, and, you know, these are things that we know how to do, and we just have to keep doing them, we have to do them well. Um, uh, and uh, so we've got a few, two, few major initiatives in this bucket. Uh, the first is removing barriers uh, to spectrum use. Um, so. Uh, where we can, where there are rules that are sort of encumbering spectrum that otherwise could be more useful, what we're trying to do is uh, potentially um, liberalize those rules to, um, to make the spectrum more valuable uh, to uh, commercial users. Um, and uh, two examples, one is the AWS sport proceeding we have underway, uh, comments are actually due, uh, first round of comments are due this week. Um, and 
Jeremy Marcus here in the audience is one of the major uh, staff force behind that. Um, but essentially, the, um, the, the AWS 4 uh, is looking at ways to take some MSS spectrum, mobile satellite spectrum in the S-band, which is very valuable, um, and find ways to make it more useful for mobile use through uh, fundamental rule changes. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, we, uh, the chairman announced we're going to try to bring the electricity home by the end of the year, and uh, we're, we're committed to, to working, uh, 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 you know, at, at pace uh, on that. Um, the other smaller example, I mean, there are lots of examples. A smaller one is there's a arcane rule in the uh, 800 megahertz ESMR band, that's the, uh, the band that's spread next to has after their spectrum swap, that actually, believe it or not, prevents them from deploying CDMA or LTE in their band. So, uh, you know, what we're doing is we're, we're basically lifting that rule, um, and hopefully that'll be completed uh, this month. Um, Second uh, thing we're doing is we're moving ahead with some of the key provisions that Spectrum Actor could auction. Uh, with, the Spectrum Actor requires us to auction 65 megahertz of Spectrum that's in the SEC's inventory. We're trying to do it in a way that will maximize the value of Spectrum. We don't want to just kind of put it out there in a way that won't, um, you know, will sort of um, not maximize value. So we'll be, you know, initiating, we'll make some that uh, in due time. We have three years from the passage of the Act to actually license the Spectrum. Um, and, and uh, as the chairman said last week, you know, people talk about the age of auctions being over. I, I think that's premature. This is just a good example. If there's some spectrum out there, auction, so the auctions have been a very valuable tool. We're going to continue to use it where we can. Um, and then last, under the Act, um, uh, uh, the NCIA, I'm sure Carl, I'm not sure if we will, I don't want to put the words in this, but Carl may talk about this. Uh, but the, the Act requires NCIA and FCC to, to look into um, uh, Wi Fi use of the 5 gigahertz band and expand the use in that band in a way that would allow for uh, potentially very wide channels, 80 megahertz, 160 megahertz uh, uh, Wi-Fi channels, which could do some pretty amazing things from a user experience. And um, so uh, uh, there's a sort of multi-stage process there, and we're, we're eager to participate in that, and we'll be uh, doing that uh, as a lot for us to do. Okay, so the second bucket um, would be emerging opportunities, or what I would call new tools. Um, these are uh, actions where we've got new um, capabilities at the FCC's disposal to try to help um, meet the country's spectrum needs, and you know, sort of, we're inventing it as we go, so to speak. So we have to try to um, innovate in the way we do things. Um, the two best examples of, of examples of this: one is incentive auctions, which everyone here has heard a lot about. Um, Happily, we're not here talking about passing a law. We're here talking about how to implement a law, and uh, we are um, uh, working hard on that. We've announced we will um, be putting out a notice of proposal making by the fall on that. It turns out to be a fairly complex uh, set of activities. Um, one sort of footnote, side note: um, the chairman announced last week that we'll be hosting, or the SEC's Technology Advisory Committee will, Council will be hosting a uh, formal band plans uh, that. We'll look at uh, how we should think about band plans in a new era of LTE with asymmetric channels and all this kind of stuff. That'll be, um, that's not only related to the incentive auctions, but hopefully we'll inform the incentive auctions. Um, and then the second piece is the white spaces. Um, we passed the rules um, uh, a few years ago at this point, and now we're in the action phase. Uh, we've got some database administrators up and running. We've got um, some devices that have been certified, and so we're really moving into the action phase on that as well. And then the uh, third track um, uh, is what we're calling uh, the next frontier. So these are slightly over the horizon um, tools, although the reason they're part of our plan is that in order for them to materialize, we need to take action on them right now. There are things we can do now to make sure that these techniques um, are available to us uh, in coming years. And so um, there are a few new concepts that we're exploring. Uh, one of them is spectrum sharing. Uh, another is small cells, and third would be receiver performance. Um, and we've got near-term actions on all three of these tracks. So um, on sharing, uh, we're very encouraged by the wireless industry's interest in exploring sharing with federal users in the uh, 1755 megahertz band. Um, we're going to be working closely with NTIA and with industry to hopefully facilitate a process where uh, testing, through testing and other means we can prove out concepts that will work and kind of move the ball in that band. Um, possibly establish some um, 
uh, you know, cost effectively using other bands down the road. Um, but we have to do that in a time frame that's consistent with our with the Spectrum Act. Um, so we'll be moving uh, fairly quickly on that. Recently, uh, T-Mobile filed an experimental application with us uh, to do some testing in that band uh, on behalf of CTIA. So uh, that's a good development from our standpoint. Um, second, um, and I should also mention, of course, Verizon, uh, uh, the CEO of Verizon last week gave a, a speech essentially endorsing this approach as well. So I think that you sort of started seeing a growing industry consensus that this is a path that, that makes sense to follow. Um, the second one is small cells. Um, Richard alluded to this, that you know, one way to get a lot more use out of the spectrum is to shrink uh, the radius of the cell site down to very small uh, size. Um, this was a huge theme at the CTI conference last week. People talked about the small cells or pet nets or genius networks. Um, one of the bands that has proposed to reallocate to commercial use is the 3.5 gigahertz band. And we think because of propagation and other reasons, this would be a band that would be ideally suited for small cells. So we plan to initiate a proceeding on, on that uh, later this year. And lastly, receivers. Um, obviously, it's a big issue. It's time to come. Uh, our technology advisory council is um, looking at different options to, uh, to present to the SEC chairman, um, working closely with our office of engineering technology. So that's a, another sort of uh, next frontier that we're exploring. So basically, um, you know, that's kind of a good overview of what we're doing. Happy to take questions on on any piece of it. Um, you know, calling the mobile action plan. I would emphasize the action part of it. We're really we've got you know. Uh, Dozens of staff, all of the agency working on all these different things, and um, there's a lot of work to do, um, and we're hard at work on it. Um, you know, fortunately, again, we've got some strong foundations, including SpecMac, which gives us some new tools, and um, uh, you know, we're excited to move forward. It's, it's a new era of SpecMac, so it's kind of exciting time to be at the SEC. Uh, thanks. Bill. Uh, 
were a lot of the changes that the administration recommended to improve the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act, which is the, uh, the route that we use to fund agencies when they're relocating from a band. Uh, and it now includes the ability to fund them to do things related to sharing, which is very important, uh, and also their ability to get planning funds, which, once again, to begin to prepare to move out of a band uh, requires a lot of upfront effort and preparation to do that, particularly if you're going to have to do new research on uh, recreating your equipment in another band. Uh, and uh, also, the administration then uh, working through a group called the Network and Information Technology Research and Development Program over at the White House established a wireless spectrum research and development senior steering group to begin to pull together all these ideas and research programs uh, dealing with uh, sharing techniques and new dynamic spectrum access techniques. So those portions are going, uh, are moving forward. Uh, on the 500 megahertz front, which is the area that most people focus on, uh, first of all, we were directed, not in the memo, but on uh, separately, to pursue a fast track analysis of four specific bands. Uh, we were given three months to do that. Uh, and if any of you uh, have been involved with uh, federal programs, you will know that uh, these programs are in fact directed uh, in many cases or authorized by uh, Congress, by the, the administration, uh, to accomplish certain tasks. So the idea that in the spectrum community, in a three-month period, we're going to redirect those programs on the basis of a spectrum requirement uh, really creates some, some interesting challenges because we have to figure out ways that how do we get the right questions all the way down to the program people who are following the instructions that they have from Congress and the White House to implement certain programs and so on. But nonetheless, in the three months, we did analyze four bands. Uh, in the end, we recommended the 1695 to 1710 uh, megahertz band, which is currently used for weather satellite downlinks. Uh, and that band we proposed would be made available through the use of exclusion areas around a number of critical sites operated by the government where the main data reception occurs. Uh, much of that is at NOAA, some of it is in the Department of Defense, some of it in, in other agencies. But there's a fairly small number of sites then that we needed to uh, protect. There are other users of that, uh, of that data, uh, but in our uh, proposal it was only to protect those specific sites. We also studied the band uh, up around 3.5 gigahertz, uh, which is a band used by the military for shipborne radar systems, some airborne radar systems, uh, and in the end recommended that the 3550 to 3650 band, another 100 megahertz, be made available. So within that three months, we identified 115 megahertz that could be made available <coughs> through some sort of uh, sharing arrangement through exclusion areas. In the 3.5 band, the exclusions were primarily along the coastlines where the Navy uh, ships have to be able to operate. Uh, we were unable to conclude on the 1755 to 1780 band in that three month period just due to the number of federal systems that were in there. Uh, instead, we took that on as our uh, first uh, band to be done under the 10-year plan that we put out in October uh, of uh, 2010. And we began to move forward in that band. Uh, we did find, as we looked at it, and this band has been analyzed uh, a couple other times, uh, each time resulting in a negative response. Uh, we did analyze it and found that there's uh, approximately eight major government applications in the band. There's over 3,100 uh, federal assignments uh, in the band. Uh, and those applications uh, go from everything from fixed microwave links uh, to uh, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, for flying over. Uh, some of them are used by the military, obviously, but others are used by uh, security agencies for border patrol. Some of them are used for disaster relief to identify uh, body temperature and so on underneath fallen buildings. So the, the use of UAVs is growing. 
uh, significantly. We also had air combat training equipment in there. Uh, a number of the systems, in fact, were, uh, were airborne. So we, looked, we decided to look at the entire 1755 uh, to 1850 ban, and that in itself, that specific decision, of course, has drawn a lot of interest because the industry uh, was particularly focused on 1755 to 1780. Uh, we felt that was important for us to look at that whole band because, first of all, most of the systems in the range operate throughout the entire range. Uh, second of all, the agencies needed a long-term plan for where they were moving. They operate long-term programs. Uh, they can't afford to have their systems split up into parts where they begin operating in some bands for some pieces and other bands for other pieces. So it was important to the agencies to have a long-term uh, plan. Uh, but for me, the bottom line is we don't get the 500 megahertz, 25 megahertz at a time. Uh, this, this band is the last band that the federal government has that is, uh, does not uh, involve some sort of radar or radio navigation system uh, that would have to be redesigned and moved out of the piece of spectrum. So this 95 megahertz in its totality was critical to our effort to reach 500. So that's why we stayed on that point. We think that has in the end driven us uh, toward uh, right answers. But as we put it together, of course, we reached a certain point you might describe as a conundrum. We have all these systems to move out. Uh, the time frames for moving aeronautical systems and other types of major systems like that is not in the one and two year range, but more in the five to ten year range. And some of them, the satellite systems, are going to go beyond ten years. So we had this problem of the transition, if we would create it, was going to take a fairly significant period of time. Uh, the second issue was that the total cost of the move in order to move everybody out of the van to do the equipment redesign that would be necessary to make that happen was going to cost somewhere in the $18 billion range. So we had the long transition, the high cost, and we began to ask ourselves, well, if the transition is going to take for most of these systems, or many of them, between five and 10 years, if industry has, has implemented their system begun deploying their 4G systems, and yet they're living in a shared environment for five to 10 years, it starts raising questions whether we need to pay to move the systems at all. So we began to explore, uh, thinking along the lines of, was there a greater amount of sharing that we could possibly do here? Many of the systems that the government operates are intermittent operations, and that's why we often draw uh, criticism for the lack of uh, efficiency in our use of the spectrum. On the other hand, it's unrealistic to expect those operations this, to uh, operate at the same efficiency levels that the cellular phone networks do, for instance. They are not homogenous. They are all uh, very different systems. So we've got a mix of airborne and ground-based systems uh, that you will probably never see in any non-federal band. Uh, it's, it's an interesting mix of different types of uses. So nonetheless, we came out with our uh, report after uh, that, that period where, quote, it was in interagency review. And it took a little while, I think, for most folks to figure out what it was we were writing and what we're talking about. Uh, but we are, uh, what we are saying is that the idea that the government can go off in a uh, basically a closed room on itself, uh, by itself, and make decisions to just move out of spectrum without a clear path for where to go uh, at very high cost and so on, uh, was not realistic. That we really need to sit down with the industry people to see what we can do together in terms of these operations. As I've said, many of them are intermittent, and the possibility exists that industry can operate in their presence without significant impact. Uh, and hopefully, uh, in some cases, that may be the case in the other direction, uh, that the government may not see the impact of some of these systems also. So we think that needs to be explored. Our approach to doing that is going to be uh, to build off of our Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee that already exists. Uh, 
uh, and to establish uh, a number of working groups to look at the different applications that we have. Uh, we are happy to see that uh, uh, T-Mobile, working with CTIA, has put in a request uh, to begin some measurements and testing uh, of operations in, in the band. Uh, because those, those aspects will be critical to us in the long run and seeing uh, what really works and what doesn't work. Uh, but nonetheless, we believe this is probably the, the first major step towards spectrum sharing uh, of this uh, kind, dealing with uh, licensed services uh, as opposed to sharing that we do have already in some cases between unlicensed and licensed services. So we think this is a significant step forward. Uh, Assistant Secretary Strickling, I think, has uh, basically put down the marker that the day of just relocating people uh, is probably coming to a close, uh, and the spectrum sharing is really a great part of our future. So that's all my comments. <clears throat> I'm going to do my presentation from here, if that's all right, everybody else. Um, you can suffer with the rest. This is the inter starting the interactive portion. I can make a little more elaborate. Um, so, so John, I thought, very well succinctly put into the problem, which is that demand is outstripping supply perspective. So the question, of course, is what can the government do to help? Um, it's important we phrase that question carefully because the impulse is to, well, you know, the government has to, to sort of coerce more out of less. And what we've learned in the past, uh, when it comes to spectrum, is the command and control approach just really doesn't work as much anymore. Um, especially as we see mobile evolving so rapidly. If you create very specific rules for very specific services and very specific bands, you find that what you thought was the need and the best use changes before you've gotten very far. So when we say what should government do, we need to remember it's, it shouldn't be a command and control approach. What we really need to do is figure out how we can get more spectrum, more supply for the market to use in a flexible fashion to dictate where, where the evolving needs are. Um, and and uh, we found that auctions have been quite successful in trying to do that. And the more we can liberalize that auction process, um, make it less command and control, let the market determine how to play a resource, the better off I think the, the, uh, the mobile ecosystem will be. Um, so what have we done? Well, we just passed the spectrum provisions in the middle class um, uh, tax relief and job creation act, as mentioned. Um, and believe it or not, often spectrum moves in uh, financial vehicles, uh, financial vehicles because of the, the value of the spectrum. Uh, and that, which is one of why they're going to pay for it. You recall uh, the most recent uh, spectrum we also cleared from the DTV transition also moved on a, uh, essentially a budget vehicle. So that legislation will actually uh, be a great first step. Um, and I'm glad John started with what people often forget. And sort of the, the sexy part of it was the incentive options and the broadcast incentive options in particular. Um, but we all know that will take you know at least three, maybe five years. It has to be done in 10 under the law. But we also actually require clearing of 65 megahertz of other spectrum within three years. So within three years, we are going to get more spectrum in the marketplace under that law. Uh, people forget about that. So that's the first good step. Uh, the other step, which where more, more the attention was placed, was the broadcast incentive options. And that could raise as, as many, or clear as many as 120 megahertz. We didn't dictate the amount of spectrum um, uh, because as we talked with economists and others, we felt that it really should be a marketplace, and that depending on uh, the the value that the current users of the spectrum place on that spectrum, and what the, the value that other users of that spectrum might place on it, the market, the auction, will set the right amount of spectrum to clear. This is the whole point of the reverse auction. Um, at the same time, that will be a challenge. And so we know that is not going to be you know, one year from now. It's probably going to take a little more time. Uh, you know, Again, hopefully three to five, but it has to be within 10. Um, again, another provision that many people forget about in that legislation is the general incentive option provisions. So while we've all identified broadcast uh, spectrum as a potential source of incentive option, um, there's other license holders who may also uh, look at, uh, again, particularly if they've obtained spectrum in a very command and control regime that we used to follow, that you know what, what, what my license allows me to do is not really what the market needs right now. And so the word I've been using is transmogrification. 
Calvin Cal Cal Hobbs fans out there, but uh, if you are, go ahead and do a quick search for Calvin Hobbs of transmogrification, because I think it's an apt analogy. Essentially, what we're trying to do is take a spectrum that has command and control properties and change it into flexible leaders. And that's the idea, is that any user who says, you know what, I'm not making, you know, the business need I identify is really not the right business case now, can turn in that spectrum for a share of proceeds to use that capital infusion for other purposes, maybe even related purposes, and at the same time, turn that spectrum into more flexible use for someone else to use. So those are a variety of ways we can get more spectrum uh, into the marketplace that we've already put into place. Um, but it's only one step. Uh, again, uh, we're not going to make our 300 uh, megahertz goal within uh, by, by 2015 or 500 by 2020 unless we find more. And right now, the largest user of spectrum is the federal government. And if we're going to meet those goals, we do have to become more efficient in the way we use federal spectrum. Uh, again, uh, the spectrum was, was allocated in a different era, uh, under different regimes, and uh, the reality is we just need to, the incentives were slightly different, we need to rethink how we allocate spectrum, both for, for federal and commercial use. And so, uh, for the next step, uh, after our, our, uh, our spectrum provisions in the middle class tax with that, Chairman Walton set up the Federal Spectrum Working Group, um, where we're, what we're going to do is have members do a slightly deeper dive into federal spectrum use. Um, hearings are great, but on a complex issue, as, as Carl can tell you, as federal spectrum use, um, a sort of limited time uh, you have in a hearing with a finite set of witnesses just can't do the issue justice. So um, this is not meant to be a formalized um, hearing type structure. We're going to bring in uh, stakeholders and, and help the members really get up to speed on some of the more detailed aspects of where federal spectrum is being used today, what are the challenges in whether it's clearing, moving. Um, one thing many people uh, sort of have focused on, which we're starting to hear some interesting anecdotes about, is that you may actually be able to move federal uses to the commercial sphere. One of the examples we've heard recently, a good one, is video surveillance where ironically, while there may be dedicated video surveillance systems using Spectrum for the government now, it's often better to hide those uses in commercial networks. Because the last thing you want to do is have someone sort of see a sudden spike in use of Spectrum, which is sort of a tip off that, well, maybe someone's using a video surveillance system on my criminal operation. So um, it's, it's not just sort of moving necessarily. We may be able to consolidate or repurpose or or re, not relocate, but move federal uses to commercial uses, which also can free up spectrum. Uh, and so essentially what we want to do is sort of do a deeper dive on the report we just got from MPIA. And that's what over a, a series of member meetings with stakeholders uh, and staff, um, when, when members are not here, uh, to sort of dig into the meat of that report, uh, help shape uh, the issues, and set up actually then some, uh, hopefully a series of hearings on where we go from here. Again, not, not, no specific legislation is targeted. It's more a deeper dive to get the members up to speed. And hopefully we'll, we'll use that for the, the next step in, uh, in our hearing process. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Richard and IBI for uh, having me here today. Um, I actually don't think I have too much to add to Neil's presentation. I think. Uh, it, the Federal Spectrum Working Group does present a very exciting opportunity for members of the subcommittee and staff to work together on a bipartisan basis so that people can be brought up to speak with staffers and members to get a, a deeper understanding of how just spectrum works, like Richard's presentation earlier today, which I think will be uh, very beneficial if you want to come in and, and do a presentation for members and staff of the, sub, uh, of the working group. And I think personally, uh, there are several other subject areas within the umbrella of spectrum issues that uh, I believe the working group can work on. And uh, at least even outside of the uh, working group process that I think the committee should focus on. And I'll just touch on some of them briefly. Uh, one of them uh, is the uh, CSEA reform provisions that was contained in the legislation that was passed back in February. We're building a lot more uh, carrots for the federal agencies by making a lot more uh, uses um, 
allowable costs for reimbursement under the CSEA. And I think that uh, contained a couple of provisions that focus on rulemaking and making sure the agencies come up with a framework moving forward for the agencies to comply with. And uh, certainly, I think that's uh, something that the community and Congress needs to continue to pay attention. Um, um, uh, in, in terms of talking about the 65 megahertz of spectrum that's identified uh, for auction in the bill uh, under the FCC's uh, uh, oversight, I, I think uh, part of that is also the 15 megahertz of spectrum that the FCC has to identify to pair off the auction with uh, 1695 to 1710. So I think that's something, again, we're going to uh, have to pay attention to. And um, uh, I know Carl talked about sort of NTI's approach, and I, I think Democrats not only agree with sort of looking at the use of spectrum in 1755 to 1850 in a more comprehensive manner. But at the same time, I think there's strong desire in order to maximize the value of the spectrum that's going to be auctioned by the FCC, then we'll have to look at the opportunity of pairing uh, the AWF3 spectrum that's not currently being used, which has to be auctioned under that legislation in three year time frame uh, and the potential of pairing that with 1755. So we have to sort of all work together and making sure that uh, a spectrum is ready to go uh, and its value is not diminished by the fact that we can't find comparable quality spectrum uh, to make it uh, attractive uh, for uh, commercial services. So, and finally, I want to re-emphasize the points that were made before about sharing. Uh, certainly, uh, many members on the Democratic side, uh, both on the subcommittee and in the federal spectrum working group, support the idea of sharing. Uh, we believe that uh, in order to improve the efficiency, we have to uh, look at um, all the available options, uh, as John was talking about earlier. So uh, that's something that we are uh, very interested in exploring. Uh, both from a technological perspective and also for, uh, from a policy perspective. And uh, was only uh, welcomed the news earlier uh, last week in the Verizon uh, and, and T-Mobile was pledging to, to start looking into this. So um, those are the things I think um, uh, I, I would uh, believe the committee should uh, continue to look at and, um, and work on together on bipartisan basis. Nita Tobey, um, I work at Senior Policy Advisor to Senator Mark Warner, is a member of the Senate Commerce Committee, um, plus he's a long standing personal interest in some of these um, telecom issues. Um, and I think that you know, um, the, the panel has all made some great comments, and um, certainly on the congressional side, I think Neil and Sean have um, really raised some issues that very much concern my boss in terms of um, you know, ranging from having a real sense of federal needs versus wants, the kind of what a forward planning world looks like, uh, both for federal users and for commercial users. And I think Neil actually think had on to um, a point that, that is um, that really kind of drew our uh, interest when you were looking at the NTIA report. Some of the some of the kind of um, discussion about prospective uses was very telling in terms of how agencies see functions um, and one of the ones that really caught our eye was also on the surveillance piece. I mean, the idea that in this day and age we'd be able to set aside 30 megahertz for surveillance. At the same time, we're building a new public safety network and we're doing all these other um, other things, I think is, you know, it, it seems to lend itself to the, that we're at a time where we really need to think about things differently from kind of the way we've looked at the world before. And I think the other kind of interesting point is it's a very nonpartisan issue. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's a, it's a great place to talk about what a real marketplace looks like. Um, it's a perfect economic study of incentives and, and disincentives and how you, um, you know, really create innovation in the private sector, but also in the public sector, because I think that um, you know, drives opportunities for companies. It, it makes our military more efficient. It um, does the same for our intelligence community. And really, there's a host of reasons why um, you know, uh, really pushing both the private sector and the public sector to, to maximize that use, um, I think we see great benefits there. Um, one of the issues I know for, for my boss has been kind of a long-standing um, point of interest is having a real sense of what a spectrum inventory looks like. Um, it's something that we've, uh, we've worked on uh, in, in, for 
several years now with them, with Senator Snow and, and others. Um, and I think that this, this sense of kind of purpose and use is an ongoing question. And I think the difference between the government and the public and the private sector is that you know, our sense on the government side is that you figure out what your needs are and you make a plan and you move forward. There's not really a sense of going back and reevaluating your priorities, your needs, you know, what has changed with the same um, in the same way that the private sector, you know, is really forced to be dynamic because if you don't make those hard calls, you go out of business or you, you know, something else happens to you. Um, and I think we'd love to see a little bit more of that discussion um, on the government side. Um, and I think um, I think one of the things that we also really liked in the um, payroll tax bill was um, you know, some of the, the changes to the relocation process, which are, those are really important. And I think that, um, that Sean is right that sharing has a lot of value to it. And I think our hope is that we would get both sharing and um, clearing of stuff. I mean, I think you've got to do both. And, and I think that to say that we would, you know, that the bulk of the 95 members can only be shared and can't be cleared is also probably not, you know, we're gonna have to ask tougher questions, I think. Um, moving forward. Um, and I think other issues of interest and certainly incentive auctions and, and figuring out how to um, how to maximize spectrum. I think there are other uses and, um, beyond just the broadcasters. I think for my boss, I and mean, he was very interested in the idea of um, public safety users and engaging in some kind of incentive auction too that might help with some of the costs of managing and deploying this um, you know, pretty, we hope this is gonna be a pretty incredible nationwide network. Um, but I think there are some great ways where maybe you can add, you know, other users, you can add federal users and, and figure out how to get to us some assets that aren't um, doing very much because they're they're maybe underutilized. Um, and our hope is that that might make a more robust um, network and, um, and really drive some innovation both in that sector and, and again in the private sector. So I think those are some of the big issues. Right? Well, thank you. I am Matthew, still trying to say relevant pussy. <laughs> <laughs> but my boss hasn't left yet. And, and she has been kind of, uh, you know, been advocating for spectrum reform, comprehensive spectrum reform for the past several years. Uh, and certainly the first step she believes is a comprehensive spectrum inventory. We still don't have that. And no disrespect to the FCC with their baseline inventory or Carl and the rest of the folks at NTI with their targeted. Those are just finite snapshots in a very wide spectrum of spectrum. Uh, just to give you an example, there are over 2 million active licenses at the FCC. Uh, NTI has over 450,000 frequency assignments that they manage. So in order to think about the long-term planning, we absolutely have to have a clear understanding of how the spectrum is currently being used in Bayou. And that means uh, a greater understanding, more data points on the, from the licensees, greater transparency, uh, obviously, SANS, you know, public safety and national security uh, considerations, uh, which you know, the inventory legislation we passed in, in, in the past, or almost passed, included. But it also, in addition, requires a long term planning document. And again, don't mean any disrespect to FCC or NTI, because when we talk about long term planning, you know, FCC says, well, we have Chapter 5 of the National Project. But we have to remember that it's only focused on wireless broadband primarily. And there are a whole host of <coughs> radio based services that consumers and citizens rely on a daily basis. And I refer you back to the President Bush's administration in June of 2004 when they released this uh, President's Spectrum Policy Initiative. And one of the re recommendations in that was a national strategic spectrum plan that is yet to be uh, completed. And I think without those two major exercises, we're kind of shooting in the dark because we can say incentive auctions, yeah, the hope was to free 120 megahertz. Some people are saying we'll be lucky if we get 60 from it. And looking at some of the broadcasters, they're almost advocating that broadcasters, no broadcasters participate in. So it certainly uh, is concerning uh, because it does present a great opportunity, another mechanism in the whole suite of tools to use. Uh, but it is a thing where we have to look at the incentive auctions. You know, we you know, increase flexibility with the NSS. We look at 1755 to 1850. And then the big question is, what next? What next to uh, 
you know, satisfy the insatiable demand for capacity. Because I think that's one of the critical issues. There's so much focus on the spectrum, but the key issue is capacity, network capacity. Spectrum is a key component, and I will say it was, uh, Sarah was very delighted here, you know, uh, the chairman's uh, remarks at CTI, because he did seem to put a greater emphasis on more aggressive sharing opportunities, as well as techno te technological innovations such as spectrum cells and others. And I think, you know, that's something that we really need to work, I think, that is really right for public and private partnerships. Because that's what's going to happen. Sharing, you need to have a partner. Because we can break all these great technologies, Cali Ray, BSA, but we don't have anyone to partner with to share with, it's a moot point. And no one company, I think, is going to really invest the incredible resources to do that without certain guarantees. And I think the great thing is with sharing is it can be two-way. It can be full duplex. Commercial can share with federal, and federal can share with commercial. Because that presents a win-win, a true win-win scenario. Also, when you talk about technical innovation, you know, Femto cells and all these are just the beginning. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you have heard of Twisted Ways, and I know it's, 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 there are some skeptics about it, but it shows some huge potential in what it is is basically kind of a, a derivative of MIMO, spatial multiplexing. But what these Italian, I think, uh, scientists did is they were able to transmit two independent radio signals over the same frequency. And that is absolutely fascinating because if n equals 2, n equals 4, 5, 10, and it's it just absolutely fascinating the opportunity and how that would change the complete dynamics of how we manage spectrum today. If you can have multiple independent signals using the same frequency. Again, let's be skeptical, but let's see this to fruition. Also, quantum entanglement. You know, the, now I'm getting really kind of Star Trek-y. But basically what that can do is where you actually can transmit data without even using the fruit spectrum at all. And what, uh, you know, the great physicist Einstein called spooky physics. Uh, so I think that there's just some huge potential here. And I know I'm optimistic, uh, you know, one of these, you know, engineers, crazy engineers, talking techno speak, but never tell an engineer that something's not possible, because nine out of 10 times they're gonna prove you wrong. And so I think it's just having a longer term vision of what we can do and how we can meet the, this growing out. Because you know, you talk with Carl and everyone at NTI, they're gonna you know, give you their federal spectrum plans and show you that there's actually increasing demand for spectrum from federal users because of how their changes in what the services that they're providing to citizens, how our threats are changing, which require different tactics by our military. So, you know, we have to have everything on the table. There's no question about it. But we also have to make sure that we have a, a comprehensive, multifaceted approach to address this problem. That's what uh, Senator Stone, you know, is, is strongly going to advocate for her, the rest of her tenure here is that we continue to have great focus on this, not just by piecemeal approach. I mean, certainly what was passed in the the law or the legislation uh, earlier this year, I think, you know, was a great first step. But again, it is only the first step. And we have to have continued focus because it is a very dynamic industry that, uh, that needs a constant focus on. So, thank you. Department 
issued by Treasury, uh, DOJ, DHS, United Postal Service, all kinds of agencies that use video surveillance in throughout that band. Uh, so the idea that one of them has 30 megahertz dedicated to them, I, I don't, I'm not sure where that idea comes from. So they're not only operating throughout the band, but they're operating throughout the band at the same time that the air combat training systems are flying, fixed microwaves are operating, aeronautical telemetry is going on, uh, all of those airborne systems, tactical radio relay being used for training by the, uh, the military at bases and National Guard units all over the country, all at the same time. So that's, that's the kind of mixture of systems you don't see anywhere in the commercial world. And you can deem that as inefficient, but they're not things that share very well. Now, there is certainly the good question, I think, about how video surveillance fits in and certainly, um, you know, what uh, a surveillance officer would like to be using. I mean, it's, you would probably rather go into a very difficult place with something that looked like a cell phone than going in with a big boutonniere that had an obvious camera sticking out of the, out of the front. Uh, and, and the idea that your signal could be hidden in the environment also is a very attractive idea. The challenge for them is that they need to know that they can go anywhere they need to operate their surveillance system, that that network is going to be there. And that becomes the big challenge, and that it's going to meet their need to ensure that the signal gets through when that agent is in harm's way or collecting uh, uh, evidence and so on. So the network has to be available. They have to be able to count on that. Now, whether those agencies can work together with the commercial world to create an environment where they can go on and off the network, where if the network is not present, they can put up their own antenna and basically connect into that network uh, and operate their own system. I think those things are all you know, things that need to, be, uh, need to be pursued. But they can only be pursued through a dialogue between government and, and industry together. Yeah, I mean, because what it suggests to me is that, that when you look at that, and the, the thing that I really thought was kind of groundbreaking about that the report on the 1755 uh, to 1860 band was at our, our A250. It's the first time that I'd seen that level of detail about exactly what it is that the government is doing with all the spectrum. Because, the, I mean, the, the general analysis, and it's really hard to back this up with the specific data, but the general consensus among the, the folks that I talk to who are spectrum analysts that operate globally is that the United States has allocated a significant chunk, say 200 megahertz, on the order of 200 megahertz, probably plus or minus 50, more to government uses than other governments have. In, in comparable, I mean, in Germany, for example, where they don't have any, anything approaching the military allocations that we have here. Uh, Germany's got a gigahertz of spectrum available for licensing to commercial mobile networks because they don't have all of these kind of legacy government applications, you know, that, that we do here. So isn't the challenge, I mean, how do you incentivize a government agency that has an application that they rely on, that's reliable, they've, they've had it in place for years, it predates the cellular network probably, or certainly predates, say, 3G, when cellular started to get really interesting. How do you incentivize them to rethink that application and in, in terms of their mission? How could they accomplish their mission without the requirement for dedicated spectrum when the spectrum has no cost to them? In the commercial world, you know, it's easy to turn these kinds of questions into dollars and cents, but what's the, what's the, how do we incentivize government to be more efficient? Well, I think, you know, certainly, you uh, see this like um, the idea that uh, we're, you know, we're going to tell somebody, for instance, to pack up and move out of their house and to move to another place that somebody else has deemed to be comparable. Uh, it's not a very warm feeling. Be told you're going to be packed up and moved somewhere else, and 
you know, your spouse asks you, well, is the house is going to be as good? And you say, well, they tell me it is. Uh, but when do we have to move? Well, as soon as possible. Um, so I think the issue of incentives is you have to give people the ability uh, to make uh, to do those studies, to look at those issues, and ultimately to reach those conclusions. I think we're certainly making the point in all federal uh, procurements that this part of the spectrum, the beachfront, is something, if they're going to be in that range, they need to start talking about why they need to be there. Uh, many of the systems, of course, uh, do go back a long way. Uh, but, uh, the, for instance, the air combat, or excuse me, the uh, uh, air route surveillance radars at 1300 megahertz have been built there because of the longer range that they, they're able to obtain. Uh, whereas the air traffic control around airports is done at 2700, 2900. Uh, so those, those bands were chosen in part because of propagation characteristics in part because we were on this march up the spectrum and they were available at that time. But to, to uproot the air traffic control system uh, is a major undertaking. It's not a three month study. It's not a, uh, you know, just make it happen kind of thing. It's a major issue. So I think we've got to, we've got to give them the tools uh, to make those moves uh, if, that's what we, uh, if that's what we want. But we can't start off with the premise that of course you can take a military radar and move it from 3 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. It may or may not be able to do the same thing. Oh, I think it's bad. I mean, uh, you know, I think, you know, in regards to the resources, they need the funding, but they also need, you know, the personnel to execute those, you know, planning requirements. But also, I think it, there's a, you know, a, a domino effect. I mean, okay, well, you try to move someone from, you know, government user from band A to band B, well, there may be occupiers in band B that may then have to move somewhere else too. So, uh, you know, it is one of those things where I think, again, yeah, the long-term planning is, is critical to figure out because, you know, there are life cycles in the technologies being used for the applications, and we have to kind of juxtapose that with the greater need of spectrum moving forward. I just wanted to add that I think for a lot of members who were working on the, the legislation that got enacted in February, and Neil, please feel free to jump in here, I think part of the goal of uh, working on the CSA reform is to provide incentives so that the agencies have greater level of comfort going forward, whether it's for relocation purposes or for sharing purposes. And so we expanded uh, the definition for what qualifies for reimbursement. We allow for upgrades to comparable systems. And, um, and again, we, we allow for reimbursement for costs associated with sharing. So uh, I think uh, we certainly are open to more conversations about why the incentives are there. But let's start looking at this, the incentives uh, that has been built in and how the agencies are going to start utilizing it. You know, I guess to, to pick up Carl's analogy, the, the whole point of the C SEA, even as originally drafted, or as most recently drafted, was so that you knew where you might be moving and that you could determine if it's the right fit. It is a collaborative process. The, the governments and the agencies are involved in They are guaranteed to be made whole and that we have to cover the cost of the move. Um, when we went through it the first time uh, with Timo and others, we learned something. We learned that there could be some improvements to make sure that that collaboration worked better. And so we made those changes. So again, the hope is that it's not a forced move to a place you don't know where you're going. Um, but this is, this is going to have to be a collaborative process. Um, the agencies will be involved um, uh, and certainly, you know, in the CSEA process, as well as in our working group, to make sure we do this responsibly. We're not, we're not just saying, you know, start packing and start moving. We'll see where to, where to drop off your bags. Yeah, one of the things that, that has come out of, you know, listening to the, to the different perspectives that the panelists have is that it appears part of what's afoot here is actually a kind of a redefinition of roles uh, between the various players around this problem where, you know, we, we've kind of had a fairly traditional clear understanding of what the FCC's job is, what NTIA's job is, and what Congress's job is with respect to spectrum. But um, 
it seems like everybody's being forced to kind of up their game here a little bit. I mean, in terms, I mean, the, the fact that there is the Spectrum Working Group and that members of Congress are, are taking it upon themselves to increase their expertise around this problem um, suggests, you know, a, a, a change in the relationship of the FCC, who's traditionally the expert agency, who essentially was created because Congress recognized that they had a technical gap around, you know, a certain set of issues and that technical gap that would be probably permanent. And they needed to have a, an independent arm's length technical agency to sort of work out the technical details of implementing broad policy that, that was made by Congress. And then, then uh, NTIA has kind of a similar role, I think, with respect to, to federal unions. Um, is this is this really is it a question of, of Congress becoming more proactive and taking a bigger slice of this, or is it just that everyone is, is increasing their expertise and, and still performing their traditional roles? And I think it's, it's a continuation of the usual buy or rent question. Right? Each use I mean, it's about uses, and it's both for the the government user and the commercial user, which is you need to build a dedicated network for your own dedicated purpose, or do, do you do better seeking someone else's network where you are a client, you are a customer? Um, there are going to be cases where the federal government needs a dedicated network. We surmise there will be cases where they don't, and the good thing is that the report helps tee up those questions that we can all look at. It may be that we also find that a number of agencies have dedicated networks all doing very similar things. Maybe a number of agencies can have one dedicated network for multiple similar purposes. Like a nationwide public safety network. Perhaps. Um, <laughs> so those are the questions that we need to be asking. And, and I think the, the report, as you point out, really does a nice job of laying out all those issues for us all to sort through. And uh, not the working group will be the solution, but we are trying to get a group of members to do a deeper dive to look at those issues as well to advise the subcommittee and the full committee and the Congress on where we go from here. We are not, we are not going to meet our special needs unless we do more. Thank you, John. Oh, no. I'm just standing up, standing up straight with my mom. <laughs> I think uh, certainly uh, all of us have seen the need to uh, meet the requirements for spectrum that uh, we have. We certainly uh, the, the president was moving forward in June of 2000 in the 1755 ban. There are certain of those uses that you might be able to look at and say, well, yeah, that might be able to get on a commercial network. The uh, aeronautical telemetry, probably not. Air combat training system, obviously not. Uh, the satellite control links for uh, federal uh, uh, satellites, Probably not, although, once again, there's a lot of federal use of commercial uh, satellites, uh, just not in the way that the military some uses the, the satellites that are controlled in this band. Uh, electronic ordnance disposal, maybe there's some network applications there. But I'm not sure I want to be working through a cell phone when I'm trying to defuse a, a bomb or something. Uh, so I think there's a lot of aspects we need to look at, and I think the report helps, I think, define what some of those things are. And we're certainly uh, happy to talk about any of the federal bans uh, with folks who want to sit down and discuss them. I mean, I think there are a lot of airborne civilians that would really like to have better broadband service when they're at 35,000 feet. You know, I spend a lot of my time up there. And, and, you know, on, on one hand, it's sort of nice to be disconnected, you know, but. There are times when I, when I really wish that weren't the case. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the requirements may not be all that different. I mean, we, we heard a, a lot of this sort of discussion in connection with the public safety network, where public safety really insisted that they had these very special requirements that civilians didn't have. Like, they, they needed their radios to be robust when uh, natural disasters are taking place. And as someone who lives in California, where earthquakes are just a part of daily life, um, practically planning for them anyway as part of daily life. We all have little earthquake uh, kits in, in our garages, you know, with food and water and, and propane-powered uh, cooking 
stuff, and, and you know, we're, we're just sort of ready for the next earthquake because you, you can't predict them, and you know, and you you will you will probably be out of uh, out of uh, electricity and without uh, a lot of communication services for several days. Um, consumers actually have a lot of the same have a lot of the same desires. I mean, when when there's a natural disaster, we want to be able to communicate too. So it's not just public safety that has that. And it's not just you know the military that has people in, in airplanes. So that sort of there's a broader way to think about it, maybe. It's like the com there aren't commercial networks today that do those sorts of things, but if you, if you think about the application as something that might have commercial appeal, which I think it probably happened as you develop these uh, partnerships with the private sector uh, around the, the sharing concept, that you know, there may be actually some, some broader solutions that you know, we don't have right now that can help move the whole thing forward. Yeah, I mean, I think going forward, that's a good point. I think, you know, some of the things Carl's talking about, there are systems that have been there for 30 or 40 years, um, you know, for better or for worse, they were deployed in a way that you can't just swap out a little radio uh, in order to uh, upgrade them to the technology. You may have to actually sort of rework the airplane or, or other things that are very expensive to change. I think that kind of speaks towards, in the future, I mean, there's probably some you know, good practices um, to think about. You know, one of them is a modularity principle that when you're developing systems, you have some ability to swap things in and out. I think several cases recently that have come to our attention that would have been useful. Um, tunability is another one where it's not, you know, where there's not a high cost where you, you know, the, the requirements don't uh, you know, prevent it. Uh, uh, having the having ability to retune to different pages so you don't have to, you know, completely dispose or, of a satellite or a you know, harder, something of a long shelf life, you can actually retune it. Um, I think there are, there's an exciting set of opportunities around, um, you sort of alluded to this, but you know, some of the link layer radio technologies that get used, um, you know, there's, there's you know, some places where the federal government is way ahead of commercial in terms of research and development. There are some places where commercial industry has taken ideas to scale them up, uh, you know, you know very high volumes, low cost. Um, you know, so some of the OFDM technologies that are sort of gaining wide use now in the commercial space. Um, you know, people propose, well, why not use that for uh, air to ground? You know, or why not use that for um, uh, you know other types of technologies? And if you look at LTE and some of the automated self-optimizing stuff, maybe that allows for greater sharing and coexistence because you can have think of it as a cellular network which points up instead of just sideways and the network is smart enough to be able to deal with the interference in a more dynamic way than, than you know, Carl or I could, could deal with it. Um, so I think there's some real opportunities there. I think um, you know, that's one of the, part of the upside of thinking about sharing is I think um, it may actually you know, result in better systems for everyone. Um, I think one of the things you're seeing in the 1755 band the discussion with sharing is that there's and partially also enabled by this technology is that um, you know, there's a lot of uses in there that are preclusive in the sense that if you, um, you know, they're all over the band in different places in Manhattan, in different places in Columbus, they're itinerant, um, they're high value and, and, and emissions are very important. Um, to the extent you have commercial technologies that may be able to coexist with some of those things, um, you may have opportunities to kind of avoid um, conflict where before it was assumed that there would be conflict. And that may, uh, you know, especially when you consider that in the cellular world, people are operating multi-band networks. Um, you know that they may be something that's manageable. So um, I think these are all exciting things. I think the challenge is to um, you know be creative and sort of really get people down to the system level to think about what are the needs. You can really get some bolts when you think about these things um, and implementing them. And then I think thinking ahead, trying to, I, I agree, trying to find ways in the process to have incentives so that people may see opportunities to um, you know use some technologies that can coexist, but otherwise they may choose things that are sort of totally you know, sweet and generous, that kind of stuff, I think will make a big difference, and um, that's something that has to be worked in the planning, long range planning process. You know, mm, okay. Um, yeah, and John, you uh, mentioned uh, about your new planning process at the FCC with respect to Spectrum. It has three tracks. Thank you.
and, and <clears throat> which are you're you working the three tracks in parallel. That's not right. And the, the one that sort of had the most uh, the most interest for me is the, the new frontier part. Uh, with receiver standards, sharing, and small cells. Didn't say receiver standards, I said uh, receiver performance. Okay. Receiver performance. Okay. Is receiver standards a bad word? Or? I think that the TAC right now is looking at a whole bunch of different approaches. You know, I think there are a lot of different ways to analyze that issue, and I don't think any particular TAC has been recommended. But these are, these are essentially technologies that the industry is developing well, it, it doesn't ever completely develop these things on, on their own, but I mean, there's, there's kind of its innovation takes place at almost in the shadow of the law. I remember uh, I worked on the ultra wideband systems that it would it would not have even I mean they didn't they didn't actually become commercial reality so far because of some some politics within the engineering community, not Washington politics, but IEEE 802 politics, which is uh, in many ways, I think, more petty and bad fighting than anything you'll ever see in Washington. Uh, but uh, that was uh, an activity that never could have gone, never could have even started without the fact of the SEC creating uh, the rule that, that said, you know, what ultra broadband is for people who aren't aware of it, is if you take some spectrum that's already being used, but it's being used in, in small chunks of like 5, 10, 20 megahertz. And you overlay on top of that a really broad channel that's say 500 megahertz wide. And then with a, with a duty cycle where you have basically little pulses of information that are moving over this humongously big uh, channel, it looks to all the incumbent services like background noise. Like they don't recognize that information is actually moving there, and so they, there's not an interference issue. But you're able to build competent receivers and transmitters that you know that make use of that by essentially stacking this overlay on top of a bunch of assignments. That the FCC, you know, figured that out. They and which essentially allowed engineers to figure out how to make it work, and we did in fact, you know, make it work. I would say, I mean, I, yeah, I think that's, that's one example. There are plenty of, that, of examples where changes in regulations or rules, you know, unlock, you know, sort of huge new opportunities. I mean, Part 15, I think the best, one of the best examples of Part 15 are license rules, you know, where you know, bands of people sort of thought were worthless and they allowed for increased power levels there and sort of have flexibility and, and we have Wi-Fi as a result. I think that's a huge uh, benefit um, from some uh, you know, basic rule changes. Um, and I don't think when people made those changes, they saw, they knew where it was going. Um, you know, I don't think they know about flexibility. It's the value of flexibility, both on the unlicensed and the licensed side. Um, you know, it raises an interesting point, and there was a recent New York Times article where this sort of created the dramatic tension between more, you know, why are we trying to find more spectrum when we should be looking for more efficient use of spectrum with smart antennas and small cells. And that always two things. One, our rules are very flexible. I mean, if people want to deploy small cells as smart antennas as they can. Um, but the second thing I would say is it's sort of a subtle point, but is that I, I actually think that the two goals are not in competition with each other. They're actually pretty well aligned. You know, it just so happens that if you look back at the history, the recent you know few, past few decades of, of new spectrum using technologies in the communication space, that it you know what typically happens is that new uh, generations or leapfrog generation of technologies occur in new spectrum when new spectrum is being advanced made available, and then they get back to to other existing bands. So, you know, the, the, the kind of ironic good example of this is, is Marty Cooper's cell phone. They had article interview Marty Cooper talked about this. Um, and, you know, there's no need for new spectrum. But, you know, I would, ask, I would ask Marty Cooper, you know, do you think that the cellular network would have been deployed had the FCC not made, you know, UHF channels available for cellular use? And maybe it would have, but it would have been a real challenge to have enough scale and, and, and investment for essentially a new industry to take off that makes use of that technology. Mm -hmm. And of course, what happened is once that happened, then that, that technology was used in all kinds of other bands um, over time. And, and we've seen that with other generations of 4G, and 4G technology took off in the, um, taking out first from the uh, DTV spectrum as you know, I mentioned before. So I think all these goals are really in concert. It's all about trying to make things you know, as useful as possible, trying to remove barriers, trying to find you know, technical um, you know, 
affordances between technologies and, and um, just knows that as I said in our plan is kind of multifaceted. And the reason is there's a lot of things, a different ways to skin the cat, and that's why we're trying to go a little different first of all. Well, it'd be nice if you know we could just sort of wait for quantum entanglement to solve. We've got that thing in mind. But uh, it's in the lab. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm reminded that, that one of Mr. Hertz's uh, students developed the radio telegraph in the 1890s. So there was actually a fully mobile digital communication system in the 1890s that sort of took a while to go mainstream. What was the name Probably, well, for 30 characters per second, probably. Yeah. <laughs> but what the heck? Okay, so uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I have one. Um, Paul Kirby of TR Daily, this is for Carl. The 18 billion figure in the report, um, that was not validated by NTIA. The, the figures from the agencies, is there any plan for NTIA to look at that and say, well, this might be high, might not be higher? Would you even have the expertise to do that? Well, uh, certainly. Uh, in the process we had, OMB and OMB examiners work closely with the federal agencies in, in uh, trying to reach agreement uh, on those numbers. Uh, I think our experience has been in the past that as you get into the actual relocation process, the numbers tend to come down. That's, I think, a reality. Um, but uh, in this case, I think uh, a big part of the challenge is we're working together with industry and in trying to make the determinations as to what needs to move and what doesn't, is that ultimately, if we find that only certain uh, systems do need to move, uh, that in fact, we will be able to reduce the cost significantly in that way. Uh, so that's certainly gonna be a big part of what, we're, what we are looking at. Uh, all of the, uh, the agencies, for the most part, looked at ways of projecting their cost uh, in, uh, in a, basically a single move out of the band, uh, with the exception of the law enforcement community that actually was the group that was probably uh, most flexible in how they might approach this. And they looked at it from a standpoint of vacating the bottom 25 megahertz as a first step and doing that by going to all digital capabilities on their systems. Uh, ultimately, however, uh, they would probably have to take another step to cram all of their uses down into a 25 or 30 megahertz piece uh, by an updated uh, digital capability. Uh, and ultimately, to get out of the band, we have to do the experimentation development necessary uh, to actually redevelop the equipment. And all of that, uh, all of that has cost to it and has cost uncertainties involved with it because they've not done that before. For instance, they're already working toward the digital capability, but they're having uh, issues regarding battery uh, heat and size and these different things. Uh, and as they continue to move forward, they're gonna have to wrestle uh, with those things. So I think uh, certainly something that creates the challenge in the cost factoring uh, is when you're having to redesign for another band. Uh, uh, we've looked at uh, fixed microwave before. We know how to do that. We know what those costs are. But to rebuild the AX system and pull it out of you know current military tactical fighter jets uh, it's a little bit of a, a, a difficult challenge coming up with an exact number. So we, we think that we're going to make progress. There's also built within the CSEA and, and existing legislation a multi-step process where the agencies put final numbers on the table and that sort of thing as the process goes on. And then ultimately, if they find they don't have to make the move, the money gets provided back to the Treasury. So there's all those things that still uh, you know, come into it. But, um, so I hope that answers the question. Well, of course, if you were to auction 100 megahertz of spectrum, I think you'd probably raise a little bit more than $18 billion. I'd be willing to do that. Just question how much of that spectrum is attributable to the federal yeah, use. Right. Um, Hector? 
Uh, I, I represent a small company, and I just want to encourage all of y'all to keep in mind that uh, innovation, it, you know, it's a, it's a real struggle at the very start of something like this, and that you all would have more mechanisms for it. In fact, we might be working with your ITS lab. We're, we're up for a DARPA grant, uh, partly because we can't, we're having a hard time finding the kind of funding. It's a new signal modulation, and not to scare the engineers in the room, but we're going to be breeze past the Shannon limit because the Shannon limit is based on nonlinearity and non and non periodic. So there's there's a lot of things out there that I think uh, can represent some real changes and some changes we have the ability to maybe even change uh, spectrum usage, spectrum value, and I just wish there were more mechanisms where the little guy could kind of come in and and uh, get a little more attention. Paul Herb Gallo, Bloomberg BNA. Um, question for John. Um, have there been discussions at the FCC uh, regarding what a uh, shared spectrum regime might look like from the FCC's uh, perspective, what the FCC's role in that regime might, might look like going forward? Um, I mean, I think you can answer the question at the philosophical level, yes. I mean, people are always talking about the concepts on sharing. And then at the specific level, in the context of the bands that uh, Carl has been describing. Of course, we've been thinking about what a shared regime might look like in that band. Um, I think um, you know, our working assumption is that it will be a licensed use, not an unlicensed use, that it would be paired with the 2155 to 2180 band, or 25 megahertz would be. Um, and that within that context, um, there's you know, sort of still a lot to be learned about you know, how the technology, the, the commercial technology would perform um, you know, when it's approximate to, to federal users or um, you know, and how, and how uh, likely it is that it will be profitable to federal users. So what occurs is that the industries come to us with an application uh, to test uh, sharing in that band and have to help answer some of these questions. Um, obviously we will coordinate and have coordinating with Carl's group uh, to uh, facilitate that, and Carl's you know, group is running their own process. The CSMAC are all basically part of one larger process, and um, you know we have a charter to uh, license the companion band in the three years of the Spectrum Act. So you know we see some time urgency to to move, and hopefully now that the perfect be the enemy of the good, um, so that we can end up with you know a paired band with a lot of usable spectrum rather than an unpaired band with less usable. Spectrum. And one of the reasons that they, when people talk about pairing these bands, that that refers to the fact that there are, we're not just trying to solve this problem in the United States about the best way to do spectrum, it's a global problem. And one dimension of it is harmonization uh, with global spectrum assignments. So when, when these particular frequencies uh, that John was talking about have been identified by the ITU as paired sets of spectrum, which means that, that there are handsets that are deployed around the world that use these two particular frequencies simultaneously, you know, one for uplink and one for downlink. And so there's benefit to the U.S. of maintaining a high degree of harmonization with the international standards. So if you think it's difficult to just move the, the U.S. forward, you know, think about trying to resolve this problem at the basically the U.N. level, which is actually, yeah, that's, that's part of the equation. So let's see. So if people could, you could give your name and affiliation. Yeah, my name's Debbie Stein. I'm with the weekends. Um, so my question is, what what is the government process barriers to make things work faster? So instead of say you were doing it ten years, you did it five years. You just if you double entire agency budget, then you could get a job done in five years. Or is it there technical barriers, or what what could make the government process work? I think, uh, at least my sense, I mean, I'm not out there in the field, but my sense is that uh, they need an orderly process. They've got to be able to function within the federal government's uh, procurement processes and getting budget authorization and uh, that sort of thing. We ran into, interesting enough, uh, although I think the 1710-1755 relocation was over 
tremendous success and I think a great example of uh, us working through some uh, difficulties and so on. But for instance, for some of the agencies, what they found is they had fixed microwave systems to move out of remote areas. And if they didn't hit the mark on when their contract was let, the snow started and they weren't getting out there until the next spring again. So it's, it's things as simple as that, that that get in the way of some of those things. Uh, in other cases, for uh, instance, with the Department of uh, Justice uh, and, and DHS, they had specific ideas of how they were going to move their law enforcement systems out of that band. Part of the challenge we found was that there was not a correlation between their plan to move out of specific locations and the commercial entrance interest in moving into specific locations. So for, for the Department of Justice, getting out of that band out of New York might have been the last thing on their list, but for some of those companies, it was the first thing on the list. So uh, we're hoping that we're going to get some of those kinds of discussions uh, going on ahead of time. But I think it's uh, overall, it's the, uh, the issues of move, moving major programs, getting through acquisition processes, getting through planning processes, uh, to make that happen uh, and recognizing once again for DOD they probably have uh, all all of the applications in the 1755 to 1850 band they have some of so it involves all those different programs reestablishing themselves making those plans coordinating it and so on so a fairly fairly major undertaking whereas those coming in are moving in with one basically homogenous network that they are trying to build out in the band. So a very different kind of perspective. You've got central control uh, on the company side. You've got known technology that they're implementing and processes and so on. It's a much, much different environment on the government side. So, so uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but I think uh, uh, giving them the ability to work through an order process is probably Okay, I think we can take one more question and then uh, I'm just covering my limited attention span. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, I just wanted to, uh, this is Dan Lubar, I'm uh, with the White Space Alliance of Trade Industry Group, but I just wanted to thank you for convenient, convening this, Robert. Um, and uh, Neil, this is a, a sort of two-part question, so we can get two for me, uh, Richard here. One's a simple question. Uh, you mentioned the stakeholder process that you're going to engage in. Uh, just really briefly, what's that going to look like? And uh, the, the other part of the question is, uh, also uh, talked about the transmogrifier, uh, who really holds on to that. There's CSMAC, there's the Federal uh, Special Advisory Committee, uh, there's, uh, you know, let's just say, uh, just curious about the leadership of who, who holds that, uh, that bully pulpit. Sure, so the stakeholder meetings will literally just be us reaching out, and I presume people reaching out to us, us looking at the members' calendars, us looking at our own calendars, and finding out when we can schedule time for people to talk. And it's going to be that simple. Uh, think of it almost like an ex parte meeting at the SEC. Um, uh, without the ex parte requirements. <laughs> uh, the the transmogrification I was talking about was, I was literally thinking about the broadcasters. Just the broadcasters have very specific limits on what they can use that spectrum for. And if I were to purchase that license, I could not use it for a cellular service. And essentially what we're saying is that if a broadcaster or someone else with very specific restrictions on how that spectrum could be used uh, wanted to sell, and someone else wanted to use it for an incompatible purpose, the incentive option allows you to do that. If the restrictions on the license are useful by someone else, you don't need to go through an incentive option. You simply have a private transfer of the license. That's what I was talking about with the transmogrification. <coughs> And you do bring up a good point. You have all these different silos, you know, the SysMac, the IRAC, you know, the TAC. I mean, and it's really just interesting because there's not one entity or committee that bridges both the federal and non-federal usages, uh, having the, you know, the stakeholders in the room. And I mean, obviously, GAO is no secret. GAO over the past you know, decade has issued several reports talking about the challenges of this bifurcated model where uh, you know, FCC deals with non-federal, and NTI deals with federal, and that sometimes, you know, the, they conflict on their overall, you know, overarching goals. So I think it's something that certainly 
uh, that there has to be greater collaboration. And certainly, one of the requirements of the statute is that the FCC chairman and assistant secretary meet, I think, on an annual basis, at least annual basis, to talk about various issues. And, and I know that they have done that in the past, but certainly it's fluctuated depending on who those uh, individuals are in the respective uh, positions. So I think maybe if we could bottom line this, uh, this discussion today, uh, at least part of that would have to be that it's probably about a million times harder to reallocate a particular chunk of spectrum than it is to make a greenfield allocation in the first place. And that's probably conservative. It's way more than that. So if only, you know, the FCC in, in 1920 you know, knew that the mobile broadband revolution was coming and, and had, had been planning for it then, and gosh, things would be so much good. It'd probably be in the same place because it would, you know, predict, making predictions about the future can be pretty darn hard. But, so anyway, I, I hope we realize that, that people can appreciate how complex the issue is, how important it is to solve it, and, and that there's actually you know, beneath the surface, the duck is peddling like mad to, you know, to make progress around this issue. And I think we, you know, it's, I'm, I'm really kind of encouraged personally by what I've heard here today and what I've learned about what's going on. But, you know, we are making progress. We are moving in the right direction. It's never as fast as, you know, the engineers would like for it to be. But, but you know, uh, I think, you know, things are looking pretty good. So thanks for coming out and I'm sure this is a good one.